Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and verses 13 through 25. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether to a king as supreme or to governors as those he commissions to punish wrongdoers and praise those who do good. For God wants you to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Live as free people, not using your freedom as a pretext for evil, but as God's slave. Honor all people. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, be subject to your masters with all reverence, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are perverse. For this finds God's favor, if because of conscience towards God, someone endures hardship and suffering unjustly. For what credit is it to you if you sin and are mistreated and endure it? But if you do good and suffer and so endure, this finds favor with God. For to this you were called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Actually, this scripture is rarely preached on, or if it is, the first uh, verse there, 18, is usually, uh, 18 and 19 is usually left out. The mention that he's actually talking to slaves. You notice that I incorporated verse 9 to kind of take us back to the beginning of what is a somewhat prolonged discussion, where Peter's pointing out that we're now a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own. Everything that you want to be, you are with God first and foremost. And we've been called so that we might proclaim the virtues of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You can see how the section concludes in the same way. You were going astray like sheep, and now you've turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls, your lives. Uh, shepherd, for anyone who's read the Old Testament, means your leader. Guardian is obviously the one that keeps you safe. That's why they wanted a king to take them out into battle. That's how the whole monarchy got started in Israel. They wanted somebody to go out and fight their fights and keep them safe. Jesus is now our ultimate shepherd and guardian. And although this scripture, because again to the reference to slavery, isn't being quoted a lot, people are going to Romans 13, it's been much in the air. All of these, what are called in seminaries, a house talfon. It just means your household duties, a table of obligations. And we did discuss this a couple of weeks ago in Bible Fellowship, and I made the observation that this was to be subject to uh, human or creatures or human created human institutions for the Lord's sake, and that it's actually a tablet of legal constituted authorities. Uh, and that means, for instance, that includes kings, that includes governors, and therefore that will also include heads of households who function as the sheriffs. They actually have real legal authority. Um, and we kind of moved past that pretty quickly because I pointed out that that's no longer the case. Uh, parents have guardianship over their children, but otherwise no member of any household really has legal authority over any other. Uh, we can tell them to get out, and that's about it. So in terms of the obedience we owe in that context, that's all he's talking about. But one of the things that I really stuck out to me about this passage that doesn't exist in the others is where Peter says, live, uh, says uh, live as free people, not using your freedom as a pretext for evil, uh, because, yeah, not as a pretext for evil, but as God's slaves. That's an interesting statement. He's calling everybody at the head of this passage a slave of God. And then when he actually talks about the slaves, he uses a slightly different word. It means a household servant. But, and that would be somebody who had a close relationship with a family, was really kind of a member of the family but not a blood relative, who had come to live and work with them and was subject to the legal authority of the head of the household. 
That's who he's talking about. And we completely read this passage through the lens of our American experience, as we do many passages. And it just doesn't add up to it. But he describes all of us as God's slaves. And that's what makes us free people. There's no authority left to give to anybody else. And all God wants us to do is to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And because we love God in this manner, we, like Jesus, seek to do nothing but the Father's will. That's what love does. It wants to please the beloved. And the reason he gives us as a motivation um, for doing this, for submitting to the authorities, is to silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Um, I had a, a friend who used to say that he agreed with Nietzsche on one fundamental point. He's a friend of mine, he's a fellow pastor, uh, and that felt the point was people are stupid. And it seemed that in a way he can be right. For a lot of people, their chief aggravation in life is failing to understand why other people do what they do and getting frustrated with them and perhaps thinking life would be easier if they would just stop it or they just knew better. And we have this temptation to want to start telling everybody what they should do and how they should live. And we think if only they listened, things would be so much better. And I bring this up here because I want to jump to the end of Peter, uh, to a verse we're not really going to get to. Uh, it's in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, 15, where he says, Let none of you suffer uh, as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. A very cool Greek word that means literally one who spies into the affairs of others. And he clearly means people who don't mind their own business and go around making mischief probably, and this is the way it's been understood, by poking their nose into other people's business and telling them this is how God wants you to live your life. Becoming a finger wagger towards uh, people outside the faith in particular. And he says, yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it as a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear it, you bear his name. This is to me what is astonishing about this passage is that Peter gives us an example of somebody who just was quiet and took it. And he says, this will find favor with God. Not that you cry out against the abuse. And he was being abused at the hands of the governing authorities, but that he quietly bore it. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to cease from sinning and live for righteousness. And I do want to, to stress uh, this a point about the dignity of quiet suffering um, and that we are to make a difference in others and to silence their foolish ignorance, not by criticizing them, but as he says, by doing good. Because that takes us directly to some of Jesus' words in Luke, where he says, if you do good to those who do good, do good to you, what credit is that to you? This is the same word, doing good. For even sinners do the same, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be called children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. This is precisely what is being said in Peter's letter. Don't just be uh, obedient to the legal authority of the heads of household who are kind, but even those who are Unkind, and he uses a word meaning bent, crooked. It's where we get scoliosis. It means that they're just off kilter. He specifically uh, um, commends that kind of behavior because that's the real test of love, isn't it? Not that we love our friends or that we take compassion on the oppressed, but our ability to actually look at the oppressor and think they're in for it. They just don't understand. There's a story... Uh, that's still told about the Amish community. If you remember some years back, they'd had a horrible incident where an insane man had gone and, and, and shot up a schoolhouse. And people were impressed by the fact that the man, of course, was not taken alive. He was killed by the police. Everyone was impressed by the fact that they went immediately to his family and supported them. But what if he had survived? What if he had survived? Would the people have been similarly understanding if they went to him in prison? 
and said, we forgive you. Please turn from this horrible way that is taking you into darkness and death. Do you not know that Christ has come and we don't live in that kingdom anymore? Come out into the kingdom of his light and his wondrous deeds. Would they have been regarded so highly then? Because in fact, that is what Jesus is commanding us to do. To love our enemies, to do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Because God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. I also want to point out that in in terms of the bad reputation that this verse gets, how it seems to be supporting uh, masters, and indeed there was a period of history where preachers were encouraged to go around and preach this to the slaves so that they wouldn't uh, rebel, and how foolish those masters were. Did they not hear that in this passage He likens them in their sufferings of this injustice to Christ and casts the master in the role of those who nailed him to the cross and puts them in a role of those unrepentant who did so. He's saying you have become as Christ to them. As long as they mistreat you, they are nailing Christ to the cross and are unrepentant. Can you not have some pity on them? If there's anyone in the world who will ultimately reject and not receive the mercy and healing love of God. Surely it is such a person who will continue to crucify the Lord in their fellow human being. None of us in this room, and I'm sure none of us, the people that we know, will ever go so far. But Jesus expects us to go much deeper. He didn't look at the outward acts. He looked at the inward man. And therefore, he tells us in his Sermon on the Mount, I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Surely you remember those words when he recalled the commandment, thou shalt not murder. He says, I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. In the older translations, that said raka. I looked that up. That's Aramaic for empty-headed. That is actually the word that means fool. And then the last one, if you say, thou fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. The word for fool there is Nabal, if you remember him as a character in the Old Testament. That fool is the one who has no regard for the words of God. It is the word for somebody who is wicked because they don't know any better. They don't know what they're doing. But that is the term for judging somebody as being immoral, as just not doing what's right of acting in violation of God's covenant. This is what Jesus is saying, is that if you say to a brother or sister, if you're angry at them, or you think they're stupid, or you tell them that you're just not doing what God wants you to do, he's saying you shouldn't shouldn't be doing that. You just shouldn't. It doesn't mean that we never tell our neighbors when we think they're stumbling. Um, And I'll again go back to the Sermon on the Mount where he says, judge not that you'd be not judged. He says, pay attention to the beam in your own eye. Make sure you get that out first. And then maybe you can help your brother or sister with the the moat or the speck that's in theirs. And the key thing to remember about that passage is that nobody lets you touch their eye unless they're sure that you're trying to help them. Once somebody welcomes and it will receive our help, then certainly we must speak to them. We shouldn't sit on uncomfortable truths. And that's why in uh, the commandment in Leviticus that tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, it says, you shall not hold a grudge. You shall rebuke your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're not, if we truly care about our neighbors, we want to let them know when we think they're headed towards trouble. But in this manner of suffering, And in this time, I just want you to to rethink the whole notion of suffering in the world. We have been taught and trained up in, uh, largely in a philosophy of Epicureanism. It was revived, for the the geeks among you, in the 1400s, when uh, a work of Lucretius called De Rerum Natura, The Nature of the Universe, was rediscovered during the Renaissance. And it is essentially an atheist understanding of the universe, a very naturalistic one. It's not the scientists who came up with that. It, was, it came up in the 15th century. But basically, it has a picture of nature that is out of control. It does what it wants. Uh, it's the philosophy of stuff happens, and then you die. 
this displaced a prior picture where we knew that things were not as they were supposed to be, but that God is patient. And as even the letters of Peter say, God is not, um, um, he's patient because he's not willing that any should perish, but that they should repent and have eternal life. And that really is all the explanation I need. Uh, This is the way God is bringing human beings into existence, this world. The longer it goes on, the more of us there are, the bigger the harvest there'll be. And that's why God is patient. But the evils of the world, it's not just a random mess. And it's, it's, it's meaningful to God. And I want to do something that maybe Peter wouldn't have quite have done. He's not saying this in passage. But I want to suggest that, yes, we understand with Paul that we're not struggling against flesh and blood. We're, our fellow human beings are not the enemy. As he said, we're struggling against uh, authorities, cosmic powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I want to suggest to you that in all of the sufferings that we see, never regard it as meaningless, even if it is largely the product of natural forces that God put into play. Many of the things that we suffer are echoes of human irresponsibility, poor decisions, Malaria is a notable example. Initially, mosquitoes occupied about 5% of the global surface. Guess who took them everywhere? It was us. The the world was not meant to be full of disease-bearing mosquitoes. But even so, as we look out into the sufferings of the world, uh, know that we have been forgiven in Christ. That's kind of the message of the gospel. In Christ, God was reconciled, reconciling the world to himself. And as Paul says, I also say, be reconciled to God. The indictment against us is gone. It's been nailed to the cross. Therefore, everything we suffer, when we have embraced the peace of God, when we have embraced the righteousness of God that is in Jesus Christ, everything we suffer, we suffer as innocents. We suffer as those who are not suffering our own wrongdoing, for that has been set aside. We are suffering the sufferings of Christ, and if it seems meaningless to us, it is by no means meaningless to God. Whatever you are genuinely suffering today, God looks on it with the same concern, the same care, the same value he placed on the sufferings of his son on the cross. Do not be robbed of that especially at this time. Because we may have rough days ahead of us. Life always has its struggles and its pains. And a lot of times, there doesn't seem to be a lick of sense in the things that we're suffering. And it may make no sense to us, but it makes this sense to God that the indictment against us has been set aside and we now suffer as innocents. And our suffering, though, obviously it doesn't have any salvific effect that's not the point in God's eyes it has every bit as precious as the sufferings of Christ on the cross this is what Peter wanted those who were suffering unjustly under an unjust legal system in which they had no say to understand do not poison your witness by crying out for your injustices do not poison your witness by judging and condemning those Rather, by your witness, by your patient endurance, by your love in the midst of all your suffering, cure them of their, their ignorance. Use the same methods that Christ used. Make sure that the witness, of God, the witness of God's love is not compromised. And he encourages them to do this by saying that their suffering in God's eyes has become the suffering of his son. We know many of the spiritual forces of wickedness, bitterness, envy, malice, fear, loneliness, despair. But there are other uh, kinds of suffering. Pain and illnesses. There's arthritis and asthma and cancer. These are the bodies turning against itself. And there are uh, plasmodia and flukes and parasites that come from without. There are bacteria. There's all these enemies. But our struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood or haywire immune systems or parasites or bacteria or viruses. It's always and has been against the cosmic powers of this present darkness that seek first and foremost to bring bitterness into our hearts 
and to compromise the witness of love and peace that we're supposed to give to the world. We don't live in darkness. We are God's chosen people whom God has called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We should be walking in that light and living in that light. If not, who will believe us when we proclaim his virtuous deeds? That too is an interesting word. It comes from the word for virtue that the ancient Greeks used. It was their idea of what constituted a good person in their values and their actions. It's what dominated the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he's saying that Christ's patient suffering, that is the virtue of God. Not the tales of warriors or of mighty victories, but that virtue of patient suffering. And before I conclude, I want to put in the usual caveat uh, that I do because it sounds as though I'm making it impossible for anyone to actually ever be a police officer or a soldier or no. Absolutely not. God help and support all those whose calling in life is actually within the structure of authority to face down some of these people. Um, These words are spoken to those who have no power and what they're supposed to do in those situations. But God help and and thank God for all the people who within the structure of authority are restraining and dealing with evildoers. That's, I don't want that to get mixed up in the message today. But even for them, they face a greater challenge because they have to use, uh, they have to continue displaying the love of God against those that they need to sometimes use forcible restraint against. They have to maintain love when they're sent out into battle. But for us, most of us, if the world doesn't see us loving God and loving each other generously, genuinely, and patiently, displaying the true virtue and power of God, is it any wonder they turn away? And we want to make sure that the reason they can't hear the shepherd's voice is not because they can't hear him speaking over the sound of us barking at one another. So what should we do? We should pray for the wicked and the stupid. Pray for them. Bless them. Honestly, uh, wish the best for them. And we should always uh, make our own choices wisely and be willing to offer our wisdom to those who seek it and need it. And most of all, we should uh, spend our time in prayer to continue to ask God to strengthen us and give give each of us the wisdom that we need in our circumstances to know what God's will is for us. The problem of suffering is really uh, acute for a lot of people right now. But I do want just to remind you of that and to really take this home because suffering is something that can drain us of our strength and drain us of our hope. God knows this, understands this. He was there. He knows your suffering. And And you do not suffer You don't get what you deserve anymore. The charges against us have been set aside and we now suffer as innocents. And God is very close and present to us in all of the things that we undergo. And may God give us the strength to undergo that suffering worthily. Would you join me in prayer? Most gracious God, we ask for faith, that we might ask in faith for wisdom because we know you give to all who ask for wisdom generously and ungrudgingly. And then grant us the courage to receive and live that wisdom out. Help the frightened child within us to realize that we no longer live in darkness, although we might perhaps be living behind the tightly closed eyelids of our timid hearts that are fearful of seeing and living into the light of your glorious kingdom. Open our eyes, Lord, Grant us wisdom, grant us faith, grant us hope, and most of all, grant us love. Amen.